screen in uh, 30 seconds we'll have it we're live in two seconds okay so just start talking owen without this good afternoon everybody and welcome to the innovation radar finals the pitching finals i am delighted to have you join us and i'm even more delighted at the 12 pictures we have lined up for you today you will be impressed but before we get to them, I do want to just have a few introductory remarks to tell you about this prize. By the way, my name is Owen O'Neill. I work for the European Commission and I'm team lead for the Innovation Radar Initiative. So uh, if I could have the first slide, the opening slide there, please. So what I want to talk to you about in the introduction is what is the Innovation Radar? What are, what are we trying to do with it? And how does that bring us all together here today? The Innovation Radar is about, is the European Commission's intelligence machine for innovations in the framework program. It's the intelligence system to help us discover where innovations coming out of the framework program are in terms of market readiness and market maturity. And also in terms of disruptive potential. This is a, a method that was developed by our colleagues in the Joint Research Center and the methodology we've been using for the last five years to discover such excellence. But there's three dimensions to the innovation radar that I want to highlight to you today. Those are identifying, uh, 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 supporting and championing, identifying, it's all about going through the projects that we are funding to find the innovations, how ready and, and, get, and, and try and discover how ready they are for the market. What's their disruptive potential? What do they need to make that step from the laboratory to the marketplace? And the second dimension is championing. As is not, no, I'm not going to get to championing. Before championing is supporting. So if we know who is behind these innovations, what those innovations are, and what they need to get to the marketplace. The, the key thing is to support them. How can we help in that step from the laboratory into the marketplace? And we have initiatives such as DealFlow, DealFlow.eu, who are supporting innovators identified by the innovation radar in that step. That could be, for example, preparing to uh, get introductions to, to investors. It could be developing a business plan. It could be creating a spin-off from a university team. Um, because it's these vital steps that we need to be able to take to encourage and to push these great innovators, scientists, technologists around Europe, getting EU funding to help them on that vital step from the laboratory to the marketplace. The third dimension I want to bring to you to talk to you about today is championing. And that's why we are here today. Equally, the innovation radar is about finding the best, but putting a spotlight, holding them up as role models to the wider community, as ambassadors for the excellence throughout the program. And that one of our key vehicles for such championing is this very prize scheme here, the innovation radar prize. We have been, this is our sixth edition of the prize. And we, 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 scan through the data we get every year to get the creme de la creme de la creme so that they can compete for this prize here today. They're competing across three prize categories. The uh, innovative science, uh, tech for society, and then the third uh, one is women-led innovation. Let's take those in order because that's the, the order we're going to have them today. Tech for society. What innovations out there are going to contribute to society and the challenges that are, we are facing here today in the world, be it climate change, be it in terms of health systems, be it in terms of transportation? Second category, uh, innovative science. What cutting edge science is coming out of the framework program? For example, under programs such as the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions, or the EIC Pathfinder, previously known as the Future and Emerging Technologies Program. What cutting edge science is, is emerging that is showing potential to deliver for society and for the wider, into, in the wider marketplace. And then the third category is women-led innovation. Women are playing a huge role in the framework program in driving innovations out of the laboratory and managing and uh, 
teams of brilliant scientists, motivating, inspiring them to do great work. And I'm delighted that we have this category and we have four brilliant innovations led by women that you're going to hear from in the pitch today. We also have an overall Grand Prix prize that will be awarded to each uh, uh, from the, these participants, these finalists in the, in the uh, radar prize today. Uh, that overall prize winner will also be featured by Euronews on a four minute program they will produce about their organization and their innovation. But the big question is how? How do we decide who is going to win today? I'm delighted to say we have assembled an absolutely brilliant jury here today, all ladies who are active in the startup and investment ecosystems across Europe. We have Aurelia, we have Vanessa, we have Maruna. They will be, uh, after the pitches, posing a few questions to the pitchers about their innovation and their future focused plans on getting the innovation to the marketplace. Um, so they're gonna make the decisions after the pitches today, but how will you find out? Well, I'm delighted to confirm that Commissioner Gabriel in the closing session of the EIC Hub, today we'll announce the winners at about 15.40, 20 minutes to four o'clock today in the Dragon's Den session, which you will see in the list of programs and of sessions under uh, the EIC Hub. Uh, so listen, without further ado, um, I, I think it's only right that I stop talking and we start giving the chance for the brilliant innovators that we have to start presenting uh, their pitches. They will have three minutes each of them, three minutes to, uh, to deliver their pitch. We will be very uh, firm on the timekeeping and that will be followed up by about two minutes of questions. So could I give the floor please to Davide de Lucrezia, who I believe is going to be presenting for Explora. And this is in the, uh, our first category today, which is Tech for Society. Davide, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, I, right. I cannot see your slides just yet. Okay, let's wait for the slides to be shared and then we can start. So, the sharing should be uh, carried out by the organizers, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. No, okay. I got it. Yes, it is. Okay, then let's wait. Um, we are trying to share screen and it's loading. Um, it says it is. Um, it is sharing already, so please let us know when you see something. Uh, we've been waiting for the system to share it for like a few minutes now. So we hope it starts kicking in very soon. Taste. at your end, you can see a, it, uh, it's saying that it, they are being shared. I see something is loading now. Yeah, we've, it says it's sharing already on our end. Uh, okay, there we go. We will switch to the PowerPoint. I, oh, no, it's gone again. Very, I, I can see something sharing. I'm, it is sharing for me now. I'm happy to confirm, this. Uh, but I, I think you just need to move ahead to move ahead to the slides for Davide, which is after Ralph. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience on this as we work out these gremlins. I'm going to hand back, Thais Davide, over to you. So thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present the first AE-driven protocol for automated design of DNA synthesis fragment, the Dulix Assembly Wizard. And we are facing a green revolution, biological manufacturing at scale, uh, using cells as a factoring to produce consumer goods. But at the heart of this revolution lies DNA synthesis and design of DNA fragments, 
which is a complex, time-intensive task. And it's not by chance that only major companies can really leverage the revolution of synthetic biology because you need deep pockets. But what if you had an effective tool that design and DNA synthesis on the fly? And what if these tools allow you to automatically design error-free fragments with an exceptional success rate? And what if this tool reduce time to the for prototyping from days to minutes? And what if you can and you could accept this tool from everywhere to a web-based hub? For this reason, we developed the Dulix Assembly Wizard. And we have a robust growth, both in terms of users and revenues, uh, working for the best and brightest in the field, like Codex DNA, Agilent Technologies, and major institution in Europe. And we do face a tough competition. Um, there are a lot of really extremely good companies out there, but I do think we stand out of the crowd, the crowd because we are the only one merging experimental data to AI algorithms. And we are targeting a market segment worth 3 billion of euros worldwide and expecting to grow uh, ex with a growth rate exceeding 20% in the next years. And we are already delivering our innovation as a software, as a service to private companies worldwide and major research institutions in Europe. Mm, now we are ready to make the next step to scale up our operation, to start direct sales in US, EU and Japan and start franchising in the rest of the world. Uh, this innovation couldn't have been possible without a team of diverse women and men from three different continents. Together, we develop and deliver high performance solution based on artificial intelligence. And we do stand by our motto, machines learn, humans think. Thank you for your time. Excellent, thank you very much, Davide. Do you have any questions from the jury? I think the I think jury, the jury is, also is also having some technical, technical difficulty. difficulty. Um, um, Vanessa, Vanessa are, you, are you with us? I can see that you are there. there. It seems, it seems the jury, the jury is not able, able to get in. So let's use this time a little bit then, uh, Davide, to just share a little, a little bit more information about, about your current status. status. Um, um, how much, how much are, you are you looking to raise? To raise? Uh, in the range of one million to one million and a half to support, uh, scale up our operation and more, and more specifically to scale up the um, infrastructure to deliver the algorithm faster and safer uh, all, all over the world and also to hire the sales personnel so that we actually can convey the benefit to the end user. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, um, in terms, in terms of, of, your, of your, like, like go, to, go market, to market, when do you, when do you think, oh, oh, I'm getting some echo. Sorry, <laughs> echo gone. Uh, so in, in terms of your current traction and, and your next traction, when, when do you see your first big customers coming on? Uh, we have, I think by the end of the year, we are in negotiation with uh, Codex uh, DNA, which by, well, uh, most of you might know, but they are the, the people who invented the Gibson assembly and then most likely will be the first adopters of this algorithm on in on a company scale. Great. And then uh, one question from the jury came in. Um, how is the process uh, that you described currently being done by, by the current state of the art? 
So there are two completely different processes. Now, if you work in a public lab, most of the time you do this manually. So you use one of the available software. There are really good ones like Genius or Benchling. And you try to design those fragments by hand, assisted by the software, but you have to troubleshoot yourself if something is not working as expected. On the other side, big corporations who have mm, deeper pockets, they tend to automate the entire process using uh, algorithms that uh, search for sequences and validate them. So to both these kind of user segments, we are offering the same benefit, automation and validation using experimental data. This is really something I would like to stress because I'm not aware of any other software that uses an exper experimental database to validate the algorithms. Most of the other softwares are really good. I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing at, at all, but they are heuristic. So they are using uh, a trial and an error approach to improve. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Davide, um, for your good answers and your good presentation. We will now move on to the next uh, presenter, Nanofos, with uh, Niovi. Um, Niovi, I see you're there in the presenter. Hello. Fantastic. OK. Could you also activate your camera? Ah, there, yeah, I can see oh, you now. Sorry, you don't Perfect. see me. A different hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. I, can we start from the beginning, please? Sorry. Mm, okay. Hello. I am Nyovia Tanasako. I am a Genkar engineer. Uh, uh, okay. It's not the first slide, but okay. And a leading scientist for innovation at Nanofos. Um, at Nanofos, we, don't do, we do not just invent simple decorative coatings. We believe in the future of functional smart coatings that could change how uh, we live and work. Everything is uh, due to our strong uh, Nanofos team, where more than one third um, is scientific R&D personnel team, uh, personnel, and half of them, we are proud to say, that are women. Uh, we believe in Europe, and Europe has to take care of its history to boost its future. We need to care. We, we, it's very important. We need to care to take care of our exist, an existing European identity. That's why we developed the most powerful consolidant for conserving monuments and historic buildings of the 20th century. Is there a competition? Of course there is, a huge one. But where there is competition, there is a market. And what we developed excels in terms of physical and chemical properties in order to solve monuments restoration. We have a great team of partners. And this is why we all together developed um, calcium oxalate nanoparticles in order to enhance the to enhance the properties of our consolidants. The market size is huge, more than a billion uh, euros annually uh, is spent for conservation. Um, and as you can see, a quarter of it is just in Europe. None of us is entering this market, and we count on your assistance to get there faster and more efficient. After all, we project a 15 million euros turnover after five years. I hope, I, I really hope we can have you on board. Thank you for your attention. attention. Any questions? Thank you very much, Novi. Um, a question already came, on, came in from the jury. Um, could you please tell us a little bit more about the kind of projects you're working on and the key results you're hoping to see? Um, the, the kind of projects um, for uh, um, the application of these consolidants? Um, yeah, yeah, like what, what kind of projects are you working on right now? Okay, um, and since we, we, we are working on ancient uh, buildings in Greece, um, also historical buildings in Poland, cathedral churches, 
um, all over the world, and uh, we are, we already have clients. We already have clients because this is our field. So um, we already uh, are partner are partnering with uh, archaeologists here in Greece and in uh, Europe conservation experts in order to get to test the material in real time and real life application okay and uh, what is the current situation how uh, how are buildings currently being um preserved um uh, uh, the uh, uh, the buildings and uh, uh, there are other uh, consolidants that are similar to ours but they have many drawbacks so they are simple materials not uh, they don't have that many functions and um, um, they are uh, and mostly they are not that easy to apply uh, they are based on plasters and silicones and um, uh, one mainly drawback is that they have uh, high concentrations of volatile organic compounds some of them are toxic during application um, their mechanical the mechanical properties of the surfaces are not that enhanced and uh, most important uh, they have limited uh, lifetime okay and so how much longer is your solution than than the the typical currently used solution uh, uh, you mean the weather resistance or how much longer than the other uh, um, than the other materials yes this okay we have a uh, here in one of us we are proud that we have a key uv and a key uv chamber it's uh, for weather resistance and so we already from the beginning that we had the uh, when we concluded with the formulation we made the uh, several tests and we we implemented in the key uv tester and the, it is an ongoing um, experiment but we already seen in comparison with the other material with the competitors that um, uh, our material lasts longer and, okay. uh, and without without failing uh, on uh, the protection of the surface Okay, thank you very much. Very relevant, especially to protect all our beautiful heritage uh, across uh, if uh, I, Europe. If I may please add that uh, we are ready to go in the market. We, we just need one year for this. So we just need to address the market. We, need, uh, we just need uh, some funding to get uh, in touch with the expert and marketing expert for dissemination. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see that we have now Rolf Ott on the call as well. Rolf, we missed your pitch. I'm happy to quickly jump back to the first pitch if you are ready to activate your camera and your microphone. And I just take the moment to confirm to everybody, the jury, all members of the jury uh, can follow this, the, the pitches, and but the communicating questions by voice is an issue, but, not, but as Thais has been doing, we're getting the questions uh, <clears throat> by messages and Tace is relaying the messages to the jury, to the, the pictures. The jury is connected. Happy to reassure you all. Ralph. Okay, so um, maybe Ralph is still trying to set up his system and get that working. I can see you in the presenters, but I will move on to the next pitch until you can confirm to us that you have it working in live. So, do we have uh, Ayaru on the call? Bernard. I don't see Bernard in the list. So, the next would be SDS Optics. I think SDS Optics we have. And SDS Optics are uh, competing in the women-led innovation category. And Magdalena, I see you in the list of presenters. If you can turn on your video camera, Magdalena. I 
I see that Ralph is indeed in the call, but he is struggling to also turn on his video. It seems we're having some technical issues. Ah, there's Ralph. So, do you see me? Can you hear me? Actually, yes, we yes. can see you and we can hear you. Perfect. Uh, Ooh, somehow, I, I think we got I can't hear copy. or see Ralph okay. yet. Okay. Pardon me? Uh, Tace was saying he could not see you. I certainly can see you, Ralph. You I certainly can see me and you can hear me. I can. And how about our jury? Yes. yes, I'm getting confirmation from uh, Aurelia. Okay. Wow, very good. Um, it's going to be hard for me to change the slides for Ralph. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn the audio on on my other computer, and hopefully I can then um, hear you, Ralph. Please just tell me next slide, um, because yeah. I can sadly not see you. Uh, it's getting better. <laughs> Almost, yes. So after some technical problems, um, I hope everybody can see me and hear me. And I am glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And today I will represent Hydrogenius LOHC technologies and show you what innovation we bring to decarbonize the world. It's all about liquid organic hydrogen carriers. So how can we transport and store hydrogen in a safe and uh, um, efficient way? If you go to the next slide, we all know we have to decarbonize the world in order to become climate neutral, to fight climate warming. What do we need? We need hydrogen. The demand will increase dramatically. And additionally, in, for example, Europe, we have to import hydrogen from everywhere in the world. We cannot cope on our own renewable energy sources uh, in order to get all the demands. So what we, do we have to do? We have to import it. And if you go to the next slide, where will we import hydrogen? We will import it from those countries where renewable energy sources are sufficient and very cost efficient. So what's the main obstacle with hydrogen? It's the way how you transport it. Until now, until now we only have the solution on compressed hydrogen. It's a very tricky element. We came to the solution, just put it into a liquid, and here is the same amount of hydrogen in it, very safe, like in this huge bottle of 80 kilograms steel. In there, 60 liters, uh, 16 liters of liquefied uh, hydrogen in a carrier, very safe, you can transport it wherever you want. If you go to the next slide, I will show you what we are doing. We are trying to liquefy, hydrogenate the, liquef uh, the LOHC liquid via our plants, put it into trucks, into huge ships, like we know from the oil business, or to trains, transport it to every customer we have for hydrogen, being a huge hub, like a port, or being the end customer, like a refueling station, and get the liquid back, like you know from a bottle system. If you go to the next slide, you can see the advantages of our technology. It's safe, we can use the existing infrastructure, and we don't have any problem with any kind of how we can transport hydrogen anymore, and it's very cost efficient. And if you go to the next slide, you can see also our uh, hydrogen story. We would like you to join us in decarbonizing the world with safe and cost efficient hydrogen. It was a university spin-off coming from a PhD research. In 2013, we founded Hydrogenius LOHC Technologies. And up till now, we got many prizes for this, for this new technology. And in the future, we want to uh, establish the first LOHC or hydrogen backbone for Europe in order to get hydrogen from any place in Europe or in the world where it can be uh, produced via renewable energies very cheaply and bring it to the end customer in order to de decarbonize the world. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, 
how safe this can be stored is one question. Um, well, I have it here in my hand. It's basically, it's like a liquid, like diesel, but it's hardly flammable. Uh, it's uh, until 13, minus 39 degrees Celsius, um, not viscosity, it has no viscosity, so you can, it's still a liquid. It's very safe, it's not the safest thing, it's a little bit like diesel or oil, but even more safe than this. And in, in comparison to every other technology to transport uh, hydrogen, it's the safest one. Uh, Ralph, I do have one question from Miruna, one of the jury members. Yeah. What challenges are you facing in further developing and implementing the technology? How are you planning to overcome them? Well, actually, the hydrogen business is an old business. There are huge companies already having billions and billions of turnovers, and we have a fairly new technology. So we have to invest heavily in research and development, and at the same time, um, scale it up onto huge plants. So we need a lot of money, of course, investors, in order to uh, bring money into this infrastructure. Like you know, infrastructure is very cost intensive. And that's one of the main obstac uh, obstacles for us, getting enough upscaling money to show our technology is safe and very cost efficient. And at the same time, of course, get mer more experience in using this technology. And I try to read. Um, um, expand on how your technology will contribute to overcoming this barrier. Um, well, actually, limited infrastructure with our com uh, with our technology doesn't exist anymore for hydrogen. From now, uh, for years and years, it was very very difficult to bring hydrogen to the end customer. With this technology, we can bring it to the end customer safely and then dehydrogenate it. So bring out the hydrogen from the liquid to the end customer where it is needed. We can use existing infrastructure. We, can, we could also use pipelines. There will be a mix of, mix of hydrogen infrastructure in the future. But as soon as it comes to cost efficiency and safety, um, we think that we have the right innovation to bring hydrogen wherever it is needed and from wherever it can be produced cheaply with renewable energies in the world. Okay, I think that is all of the questions from the jury. So uh, thank you, Ralph, and I'm delighted to have just learned that Magdalena from SDS Optic, who is having trouble connecting the video, is now connected by video. So uh, Thais is jumping ahead there to SDS Optics, and Magdalena, <coughs> uh, Happy to hand over to you for your pitch. I, <clears throat> I, I can't hear you myself, uh, Magdalena. I do see that you're... I, 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 I don't think, yes, I, I see you, 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 you're listed as a presenter with your video on, you should, we should be able to see you, but I'm, I cannot see you. No, it's because I am muted. Okay. Hello, Magdalena. I can see you're there. Can you, your microphone seems to be on? Can you? Can can you? I cannot hear you. Are you speaking yet? Hello. Okay. Ah, I can hear you, Magdalena.
No, it doesn't seem to be working for Magdalena just yet. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, I see we have another competitor work in the women-led innovation category here. And do I see Natalia from Nuiel from Hamburg, uh, one of the finalists. Uh, your, your video seems to be switched on. Natalia, yeah. can, you hear, can you hear me? I can hear you crystal clear. Great, right. right. okay. So uh, please, uh, let's let's move to you and you go for your pitch there. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much. Oh, can you please go to the, I don't know, can you see my hand? Can you please go to the next slide? 178 parcels are delivered today and every day. And in the crisis like this, there will be even more home deliveries required. That means there will be more traffic jams, more emissions, and more people affected by noise and toxic air. We can change this. We are Newville, a startup from Hamburg, and we developed an electric bicycle trailer. The e-trailer is fully synchronized with the bike, so it knows when to speed up, it knows when to slow down, it knows exactly when to stop and to brake. And it does it all by itself. A cyclist doesn't have to do a thing and feels no weight at all. It was the first electric trailer with a patented sensor technology that we developed. The e-trailer can be connected to any bicycle or electric bike within a second. It can be used as electric handcart for indoors and pedestrian only zones. So far, there is no similar technology available on the market. Last, can you please stop changing the slides? <laughs> because I think it goes ahead of me. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for that. Last mile is a huge market with many new players, but there is no safe and reliable solution yet. What makes us different it has, is our patented technology. We are the only producer that offers hand cut functionality, double brakes and integrated suspension to ensure safety of the rider. We developed three revenue streams. We sell standard trailer, we develop custom fleet solutions, and we provide services. We know that there is a demand for our e-trailer. In 2018, we run pilots with UPS and IKEA. And in 2019, we converted these pilots into the first sales. Our e-trailers are now in daily operations at UPS, IKEA, B-Post, and are running in five different countries. My name is Natalia Tumiyama, and I'm one of the co-founders and managing directors at Nuvir. As a female founder, I stand for diversity, especially in mobility. And we are a diverse team with more than 30% women and minorities among us and come from 10 different countries. As a part of Green by 2025, major European cities plan to shift to carbon neutral logistics. We received an ESC accelerator grant to turn the car e-trailer into the scalable product to enable the shift. The new e-trailer will be the first electric solution that be able to move 300 kg with a bike. We currently work with corporates, but actually we want to enable millions of people around the world to move anything in the most convenient, flexible and sustainable way. And by doing so, our e-trailers will be saving 64 million CO2 emission. Per year. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm so sorry, uh, Natalia, that it was difficult to change slides, but the video stopped working for me, so I couldn't really see you raising your hand. Um, we're going to get some questions coming in. Um, first one is, could you please tell us a little bit more about your plans for allowing individuals to rent the e-traders and how that would work in practice? So actually now we're starting the first test with IKEA. What we wanted to do, we want to go forward. So that means that every consumer at IKEA and actually every private individual can book our trailer via an app and uh, pick it up from the IKEA store and put it for some time. Uh, we partnered with a company that uh, builds and develops this app. It's called Free Trailer, and we're running now tests in Copenhagen, but also we're going to start uh, with a new IKEA store in Karlsruhe to see what was the demand and how private users take it. 
we plan to scale uh, this opportunity for private users starting from the next uh, year when we go into the series production. Thank you. A question so about private individuals do not have to buy. With, um, with the large companies building their own solutions in the space, what is your innovative edge? I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot ah, hear you well. So I will, I will repeat the question. The question came from Vanessa, and it is with the with the large companies building their own solutions in the space. There's quite a few competitors coming. So what is really like your main innovative edge? Um, actually, the Arabic corporates which are building electric cars, they are coming up with um, electric bikes. However, there is no similar technology what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing is a patented technology that enables synchronization between our e-trailer and the first vehicle or a person. So it's difficult to control or to uh, make synchronized movement uh, with a human cycling behavior. And what we've done, we developed the sensor and we patented uh, this technology that enables automatic synchronized movement between our trailer and bike, electric bike, cargo bike, maybe even an electric scooter in the future, and even a person when you walk with it. Uh, and this is what um, the technology that we developed and makes us different. Okay, and a question coming in from Aurelia. Can you give us a bit more information about your business model and how you would work with partners, especially with the delivery companies? Uh, we are a hardware company. We sell uh, hardware. But that means that we sell directly to the customers. Sometimes at the beginning when we work, it's just a small fleet, but we're planning to go into the fleet sales. Um, and here are, we're quite flexible. Either it's a direct sales or it's a leasing offer. Um, yeah, and the companies like Belgian Post, UPS, and now we're also running a pilot with Austrian Post. Um, that means that we can electrify their fleet and enable the transport of the post and parcel with a, their standard bikes, which are now integrated in their fleet and, uh, and are in a daily operation since, um, since years. Okay, and from a business model perspective, are you doing a revenue share with them or um, how, how does partnership work? Uh, no, it's not the revenue share. We we provide the we sell directly to the uh, customers like B Post and UPS, and this is how we generate the revenue. And after the direct sales, ah. after the direct sales, uh, uh, we would provide after sales. That means not only repairs and maintenance, but also uh, predictive diagnostics, which we are going to uh, integrate next year. So our trailers will be running 24 hours a day uh, without having any issue. And if there is an issue, we will know that before our customers. So that would become a second part of our business model. Okay, and the last, fleet. the last question before we try to switch to SDS Optics, um, could you, just tell us what, because there are a couple of competitors who are also coming out with e-trailers. Could you tell us what is the biggest unsolved challenge by the by the competitors right now in this space? To be honest, uh, there are only two direct competitors that, that we know, and uh, they know us as well. One of them is in Germany, and another one is in France. I don't think, uh, so far, we don't know any other uh, providers of the electric trailers. And the challenge here is to provide that synchronized movement between an electric trailer and the bicycle, or e-bike. And, um, and you're unique in that. So it depends. The challenge here... It's a sensor technology. There are two ways to solve it, or three ways to solve it. We are solving it with a third way. Uh, but normally what our competitors do, they uh, basically measure the force sensor or they measure the uh, speed sensor, which cannot provide the reliable synchronization. So that means that the uh, person that moves the weight on the bike uh, always feels this push and pull. While in our sensor, well, in our technology, you don't feel anything, and you get, you'll be able to carry 300 kilogram with your normal bicycle, no force transfer, uh, no push and pull effect, and it feels like you're cycling your own bike, but still okay, carrying 300 kilogram. And this. Is thank you process. very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. That was that was great. Um,
we will we have some other questions come in from the jury but we will make sure that we relay them to you uh, after the event we should now move on to the next presenter um i think based on i, I still cannot see sds optics but i can see thomas um from uh ayaru so we're switching now to the ayaru slides Or sorry, that was uh, Bernard. Hello, Bernard. Everyone. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Bernard. So thank you, thank you, everyone. When you're ready to start, just uh, please raise your hand, and I'll change the slide for you. Okay, so we'll start with this one. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bernard Rova. I'm the CEO of uh, IRU, uh, talking to you from Geneva, Switzerland. And I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about our product, DigiFit which is a unique app bridging therapeutical education and medical data collection, uh, primarily for uh, type one diabetes uh, patients. So our team got a tremendous success in the last year in engaging hundreds of thousands of video gamers into scientific research with our platform MMOS and with the support of H2020. So we are a multidisciplinary team of game experts, diabetologists, MOOC and therapeutic education uh, professionals with a very strong business uh, uh, focus. So as you know, uh, chronic disease is a major burden for all our, uh, our countries in terms of the healthcare system. And therapeutic education is known to reduce the mobility of patients and improve their quality of life, therefore reducing these costs. Uh, however, the present setups of therapeutic education can only address a very small fraction of the potential patient uh, population that may be interested in this. Um, and moreover, uh, most of the setups are incompatible with the pandemic uh, uh, situation. So our uh, DigiFit product um, is an app which empowers patients by offering high level educational content related to their disease uh, while engaging them uh, to collect, record and analyze their personal data such as the glucose uh, measured in various conditions. So the solution is an app with, uh, uh, on which patients perform, this is the most important, they perform protocoled exercises. Uh, and this app has a strong community and gamified uh, component, which enhances, uh, enhances the engagement and uh, retention of the, of the participants. So markets, so uh, diabetes is related to huge cost. 15% of all healthcare costs are directly or indirectly related to diabetes, which is about 200 billion euro per year for the EU. And various studies show that uh, therapeutic education can reduce this cost by at least 1%, which makes a $2 billion market for Europe. On the other hand, you have the real world evidence market, which is the collection of this data, uh, which uh, amounts 500 million per year in Europe. And we differentiate from our competitors. This product uh, differentiate uh, added value. We can we can skip. Let's jump to the um, uh, differentiation. So we have the traditional uh, way of collecting data with questionnaires, uh, which is high quality but low volume. Uh, then you have the more uh, recent product, which are social media for patients, which is high volume but uh, more complex to extract information. And we stand somewhere uh, in a good compromise between high volume and high quality. Uh, our revenue streams are lectures fees, number one. Uh, second, quality of life questionnaires that uh, real world evidence industry will buy from us. And last one, blood glucose data um, uh, that we will generate with uh, the participants. And um, uh, finally, uh, we, we made a business plan, of course, for this product. We plan an investment of 2.5, sorry, 2.1 million uh, for the next years with a break even around three to four years. And the main challenge for us is the go-to-market strategy with very diverse actors, uh, with different positions depending on the country. This is very different in the US, uh, different languages. And this is uh, uh, what we uh, discuss and work with our team uh, now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, it's definitely a hot space right now with uh, telehealth and corona going on and uh, education on, in the healthcare sector is very important. Uh, we have some questions come in from the jury. I will read them out. They're in the chat. Um, the first one came from Vanessa. How easy will it be to deploy this on other diseases? Um, the, the platform is ready for other diseases. We target 
um, uh, chronic disease where the patients collect themselves data on their situation. This is our primary target. And this is why diabetes is very interesting because uh, a, a diabetic patient, especially type 1, is trained, used to collect data on, uh, on, on himself. And uh, we want to improve the literacy of the patient related to this data. So basically, uh, the, the, the platform could be used for other uh, chronic disease, but we will uh, focus on chronic disease where there is a, a quantitative or there's a measurement which is performed by the patient himself. Okay. Um, a question from Aruna. As therapeutical education could be applied to other chronic diseases, what do you have in mind in terms of product expansion? Uh, so uh, other um, uh, chronic disease, the, the number one will be uh, type 2 diabetes because, as you know, it's the same name, but it's completely different uh, populations, I will say, and, uh, and uh, healthcare uh, systems. So for us, uh, the, the, the next level will be uh, diabetes type 2, um, which requires completely different strategies because, uh, as you know, uh, it happens at different mm. ages, the causes are very different. But uh, just with diabetes that type 1 and type 2, uh, we cover, uh, in terms of chronic disease, uh, a huge, uh, we may have a huge impact. I, I, I repeat, I don't know if I, uh, if I said it properly, but 15% of the health costs in, uh, in our countries are related to diabetes. So this is our primary target. Um, then yeah. we have other also cancer. It's not, uh, cancer has very interesting uh, features uh, for us. Um, uh, because uh, during the process, radiotherapy and so, so the, 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 the information that the patient himself can collect on his situation and on his treatment is, uh, is very interesting. Also, we have a project on fertility, uh, which also requires quite uh, um, uh, an interesting setup in terms of injecting certain um, uh, substances and, and measuring uh, the, the reaction by the patient himself. Can you, can you give a little bit more uh, examples on really how gamification can have a genuine improvement on, on the therapy um, and with some data points or example. So what I showed in my, um, uh, in my slides is some, uh, for instance, this, yes, if you come back here. So uh, we have been taking some uh, mission-based uh, sort of uh, strategy. Uh, this is the, the, the first aspect. So you go through certain steps. And these are released when you reach certain um, uh, certain results, and you can unlock certain what we call missions. This is number one. Number two, it's the community-based um, activity where people are not left alone by doing this uh, task, but they can uh, they have to actually um, join certain groups, which may be based on the common interest. For diabetes, it may be sport, or it may be a pregnancy, or it may be diet. So you join certain groups and you perform, or, 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 or it may be people you know, um, and, and, and you perform these tasks uh, together. And so it's a mission-based, it's community-based, and it requires to pass certain uh, steps to go further away. Although you may start uh, completely differently, uh, we deeply integrated this idea uh, based on, on game design. Fantastic. Thank you very much for answering these questions. There have been a few more that came in. I would like to ask you to answer them in the chat. Uh, while Thank the you. next presenter is going to present. Um, do we have the next presenter already with Thank their you. video on? So yeah, thank you very much, Bernard. Um, Thank you, everyone. I think we have Thomas. Uh, I can see, Thomas, that you are in the call. Yes, I can see your video now. That is great. We're going to jump right ahead to your slides. Um, and Bernard, uh, yes, please feel free to answer the questions directly to the jury in the chat. Uh, so they can see that later on. Okay, so Thomas, when you are ready, um, let us know. Oh, you're still muted. Um, yeah, we've been having trouble unmuting ourselves as well. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, can you? There can we you go. We can hear you now. Thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and let me start right from uh, introducing the problem that we address. Uh, and this information technology is becoming the leading sector in energy consumption. And battery drainage inhibits large-scale Internet of Things deployments. And low operation speed limits the uh, opening of new high-tech markets. And the roadblock here is the digital IT paradigm. Uh, first, 
separate logic and, and memory devices cause an information transfer bottleneck, which costs time and energy in the active regime and is a particular problem for cloud data centers. And second, digital IT is constantly on, which costs energy even in the standby regime, draining batteries of sensor and Internet of Things uh, applications. And finally, the low memory writing speed imposes a fundamental limit on reaction time and positioning accuracy of future autonomous systems or micro robots. Uh, our innovative science solution is the fundamental paradigm shift from digital to neuromorphic analog information technology. Uh, inspired by brain, it is based on devices where logic and memory are in the same place, removing the transfer bottleneck. Uh, moreover, they're completely off uh, when there is no signal leading to zero standby power. And our logic in memory devices can be six orders of magnitude faster than the digital devices and 12 orders of magnitude faster than our brain. Well, to realize our unique proof of concept chips, we use nanostructures of antiferromagnets, which are materials that so far have been completely overlooked in the IT research and development. Uh, well, most academic teams would uh, uh, reach at most uh, this proof of concept level, but we have continued on the path towards market. And for this, we have developed the entire Internet of Things system platform for generating and communica communicating data from the edge applications to the cloud. And by adopting the neuromorphic analog paradigm also on this system level, our solution uses 100 times less power than the digital counterpart, and that finally enables large Internet of Things deployments. And we are now performing real-life pilots in areas like human uh, and infrastructure health monitoring, water retention monitoring, earthquake warning, or smart traffic and lighting. And with the help of EU's Innovation Launchpad, we're planning to start a spin-off in one or two year timeframe. And finally, uh, let me introduce our team from the Czech Academy of Sciences, which is very compact, but simultaneously uniquely multidisciplinary. Our team's expertise ranges from electronic and photonic nanoscience, all the way to Internet of Things engineering and data mining. And in the past, this allowed us to not only receive science awards, but also to give birth to prize-winning startups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. And hugely interesting. Um, I, I think you're you're literally uh, re-innovating the computer systems as we know them. Um, what would be uh, the first question came in? Could you tell us a little bit more about the pilots that you're running? Um, and, and how they are validating customer demand. Uh, so we are doing two uh, fundamentally different types of pilots. Uh, one type of pilots is basically uh, pilots for feeding. Sorry, there's some noise in the background. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So the first type of pilots is uh, intended to feed the information from these pilots back into the research and development. And that's uh, with the most advanced devices, which are ultra fast and where the, the markets don't even exist presently. But uh, in order to conceive the potential of these devices, we are running these circles from R&D to prototypes, pilots, and back to R&Ds. And then we have the second type of pilots which use already established devices, but uh, also this neuromorphic uh, analog uh, platform. And here uh, we are ready to spin off uh, into uh, marketable products. And these include, for example, uh, monitoring of malaria disease uh, in Africa uh, or monitoring the health conditions of infrastructures like bridges uh, or roads but also earthquake warnings, either geological, uh, caused geologically, or in, in queries uh, with man-made uh, activities there. Uh, and we have also the more uh, standard types of uh, IoT applications in smart traffic and, uh, for example, smart lighting. And these are done in, uh, in uh, collaboration with our partners, uh, which are both from the private and public sector. Um, great. Thank you. Um, 
There is another question come in. Um, there's actually two, and that will be the two final ones. Then we have to move on to the next presentation. Um, could you please paint a picture of how the world is going to change thanks to your innovation? Uh, well, first of all, we think that the world needs to change because if we would continue with the digital information technology, uh, uh, we will run into the final roadblock. Uh, it's the digital information technology that, that actually enabled the data society that we have today. But it's projected that with the digital society, this technology will consume all energy in two decades to go. So we really need to change the paradigm. Otherwise, we will not be able to continue with the exponential growth in data. And uh, uh, the analog, uh, neuromorphic approach could clearly solve the problem. But the, 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 the issue here was that the semiconductor devices uh, that are the basis of uh, current digital technology, they cannot deliver these neuromorphic analog ultra fast functionalities. So I think our innovation is that uh, we looked into a completely new material system, uh, which does allow these functionalities. And now I think it opens, uh, uh, it, it first of all gives the whole field future, we believe, plus it opens completely new markets, which are unimaginable today. For example, going from larger robots into micro robots, which could even uh, crawl in your veins, uh, which needs to have a very precise positioning. And that can only be done if you have extremely fast devices. Thank you very much. Um, hugely interesting. Uh, and please also feel free to answer a couple more of the questions that came in. Uh, we will now move on to uh, Apentra. Uh, we see you're in the list of presenters. Could you try and get your microphone to turn on? I think your camera is starting to turn on, but we can't see you yet. If you could already unmute yourself, um, that would be great as well. And I guess, Thomas, uh, yes, it would be great if you turn off your camera, as you just did. OK, great. I can see Manuel now. And now it's just the unmuting of the microphone. OK. Can you now hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Yes. Just a second. OK, so should I start? Yes, uh, if you raise your hand uh, to the camera, I will uh, change the slides for you. OK, excellent. So good afternoon to everyone. So how can we do more things faster in less time? Let's talk about that. My name is Manuel Arenaz. I am CEO and founder of Apentra Solutions, a deep tech software company. As Jeff Immel, point, uh, CEO of General Electric, pointed out, if you go to bed as an industrial company, you're going to wake up as a software data analytics company. So software is key for competitive advantage. And high-performance computing is a key enabling technology of artificial intelligence, big data, Internet of Things, edge computing, that are revolutionizing uh, whole industries and our society. But software failures have a dramatic impact on the economy and on society, and even beyond that, in human lives. And that's where Apentra comes into play. Our tools help developers to write high-performance software that runs fast and runs safely. Parallel work products use a new artificial intelligence engine that is able to detect and fix errors in parallel software. And our competitive advantage derives primarily from two sources. So speed, we can do real-time code analysis. And precision, we can understand complex code deeply. We are targeting markets where competitive advantage derives mostly from high-performance applications that are markets that are the leading edge of the current software revolution. And market leaders are already supporting us in the development of our products, in marketing and in commercialization. As part of uh, European projects, EPIC and Maestro, we have developed innovations that have had a big impact, have played a key role in two, in two ways in this, during this year. 
It has allowed to increment our revenue during this year by 3x and also has enabled us to achieve first key reference customers in the high performance computing market. And this is thanks to an exceptional team, high tech team, internationally recognized. We are 11 people and growing during this year. And which are the next steps? The next steps are to convert current pilot projects into recurrent sales, launch the first ver commercial version of Parallelware Analyzer, the flagship product, build the sales engine, and raise Series A a round of investment in the future to accelerate the go-to-market. So, in short, why invest in Apentra? Because Apentra has a disruptive AI artificial intelligence technology that can change the way that developers test and code parallel software. Because there is a great business opportunity around parallel software development. Because we immediately release our innovations as new features in our products. And because we have an ambitious go-to-market strategy that will require new investments in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Great to see that you are also solving the problem of the, the IT hardware solutions out there and helping them become more efficient and do more with the current hardware. We've got some questions come in. The first question is with regards to the customers you're focusing on. So um, the question is, given that the technology you're building has applications across many different industries, how do you plan on prioritizing and then engaging with the different sets of customers? That's definitely, definitely a very good question. We come from the high performance computing market. So achieving and closing these key reference markets in customers in HPC is really a great, uh, a great milestone for us because high performance computing market is like the formula one of computer science from the point of view of parallel computing. So this opens the doors to, uh, to go to markets that have been working for decades very closely to the high performance computing market. So in our business, we have prioritized the life science uh, market, the customer electronics market, consumer electronics market, the automotive market, and the uh, electronic design automation market. These are the four markets that we are prospecting at this moment to try to find another, product, another market niche to deeply uh, target during the next year. Thank you very much. We have another question come in from Vanessa about the competition. So how do you differentiate from C-Lexica? Okay, that's a very good question. We know our competitors. C-Lexica has, has moved to the FPGA world. So they are targeting a very specific kind of parallel software based on FPGAs. And we are covering not FPGAs, but we come from HPC where the, we have traditional uh, we, can, we can help developers write code for graphical processing units. GPUs are at the core of green computing or, or edge computing. We also solve the multi-core and, and vector SIMD uh, parallel software development that is, again, part, a key, plays a key role in, in edge computing. So we clearly differentiate at the kind of type of hardware that we are targeting and also from the point of view of the solution because we are bringing in to parallel computing an approach that has been very successfully applied for decades in fields like cybersecurity or uh, healthcare software, where the software, in order to be deployed with a hardware, needs to be certified and audited. So we are developing all the bringing in this process to the parallel computing, uh, parallel software development that is not part of the how the developers code and test and make development for parallel software. Thank you. Final question is, uh, and then we will move on to the next presenter. I would already like to ask the next presenter to get ready to ch to share your video because it always takes a bit of time for that to start. I think the next presenter will be Daphne. Uh, so Daphne, please turn on your video already. Then the final question for you, Manuel. Um, are you because because it's a big ecosystem and there's a lot of. Um, uh, coders and experts, how are you working with the programming experts on the one side and the software vendors on the other? Okay, for the point of view of, of uh, programming experts, we have been working for several years now with experts in parallel programming in the high performance computing world. These are top notch uh, developers that are developing parallel software for 
GPU-based, CPU-based, and vector machines. So that's regarding the experts. So we work with the experts to create a whole catalog of defense recommendations, how to write parallel software according to best practices. And then we automate this process with the use of our parallel where artificial intelligence based software. And on the other side, regarding the software vendors, uh, <clears throat> we are essentially doing uh, pilot projects. We cannot give names uh, because we are under NDA, but essentially software vendors uh, have uh, Hardware vendors have software, SDK software development kits that are key for software vendors to develop the software. So we are working and going to software developers through the SDK, the SDK, SDK developers. Uh, that's one channel. And the other channel is direct sales to the final user that is developing their own software. It's a very complex Thanks. ecosystem, so I hope I have replied to the question correctly. I think so. Can you also please check the chat and uh, try and write your other answers to the jury? And uh, we will be checking the chat uh, at the end of the event as well uh, and make sure that uh, we've seen that. And probably we some people will reach out to you after the event as well. So thank you very much, Manuel. We are now moving over to Daphne if you manage to get your video started. Thank you. And uh, oh yeah, Manuel, please uh, turn your video off. Uh, it seems we are having some serious bandwidth issues today. So I'm trying to do it, but it's, it doesn't re respond. <laughs> so I will do it as soon as it works. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, So it seems like we're trying to get Daphne on. Um, doesn't seem to be working. Hi, Tess. I can see SDS Optic Magdalena is, uh, her video is switched on, but we're not seeing the images. Uh, is your microphone switched on, Magdalena? Maybe. We, if we could maybe jump to you if it was working for you. No, I'm not While we wait for that, I'd like to apologize to all the attendees and uh, people in the audience. Uh, we will make sure to share the decks uh, with everyone. You can send an email to uh, either Owen uh, from the Innovation Radar, uh, from the EU, or to us, uh, or you can put your email address in a private message to us um, as well, we will be happy to send you all the presentations that were given today uh, so that you can get in touch with the startups uh, and their very, very interesting and uh, potentially groundbreaking innovations. So please feel free to reach out to us and we will share the presentations. Thank you, Tace, for that. I do see that we have a, a video connection working for Arate from Bio yes. in Spain. Uh, would you be ready to pitch now? If... Yes. Excellent. So, Tace, if you could move to uh, Arate's slides. Hey, yes, there we go. Um, I don't see or hear Arate yet. Yes, um, can you? Yes, can you hear me? It does come through to me after a little bit, but it's going to be very hard for me to, to know how to change the slides. Mm. Um, let me... Turn off my microphone. I'm going to turn on the audio of my second laptop. Maybe, maybe that one will allow me to actually hear around. Hey, I still can't hear or see her. Yes. I, I... Can you see me? I, I, I can't see you. Um. I can't mute my mic, so I can't turn on the audio of my other computer, which is hearing Arate. I'm going to wait until it's muted. Um, okay. Okay. Arate, I can see you. I can hear you. Uh, Tez, you're, you're, you're not, it's, you cannot, can you hear Arate?
Mm-hmm. Tace, we cannot hear you now. Can you hear us? Okay, we need we need to have a, a, Okay. Tace, can we hear you? Can you hear us? Can you see me? I can still see you, Arate, and I can still yeah, hear you perfectly. Yes, I can. And it, the, the thing is, all of the slides? Yes. Are, so, uh, Arate, I propose you start and uh, oh. and I can, and, um, let's see how we can do this. Okay. I. Right. I, at least the, the jury can hear you. Okay. Uh, I, I think we can go. Arate, please go. We cannot hear um, Michal or Tez. Mm -hmm. but, but I think they can change the slides. I yes. Uh, okay. Arate, over to you. Yes. Let me begin with a number. 75. Estimations indicate that up to 75 of the world population is lactose intolerant. Some of you are probably suffering some from symptoms such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, and bloating every time you consume a lactose product. Probably you are undiagnosed or wrongly diagnosed, subjected to incorrect diet adaptation, and live with frequent inconvenience because all current states for the art methods are uh, like intolerance diagnostic methods are far from optimal. My name is the slide has gone. Uh, I, yeah, we can, I cannot see your slides now, indeed. No. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I have I have a, a message here from Tace that they are still sharing the slides, but uh, at our end I can see, it. see them. Yes, that is that is unfortunate. I, they're, yep, they are back. Arate, I I can see them now. Can you see them too? No, but it's no problem. Yes. Now, my name is Arate Jauregui and I am the innovation manager at Violent Health. As a result of the EU project OSALAC, we have developed OSASIL the first point of care device for lactose intolerance diagnosis. The solution consists of a measuring device and a test strip. Applying only one drop of urine, the result appears on the screen in less than a minute. Currently, the most common methods applied for lactose intolerance diagnosis are invasive, expensive, and time consuming, and require the intake of high dose of lactose. As an alternative, OSACIL allows an easy, faster, and accurate diagnosis, offering a cost-effective and non-invasive tool. The potential market of OSACIL is large and global. On one hand, the point-of-care device segment represents more than 50% of the in vitro diagnostic market. On the other hand, the prevalence of lactose intolerance and other related gastrointestinal disorders are increasing. Data already identifies a total addressable market of 1 million analyses only for five countries in Europe. OSACIL target centers, medical specialists, and insurances. We are. Yes. We are already making the innovation real from the lab to the market. 
Osacil has already been analytical validated and regulatory procedures have been overcome. Clinical validation is ongoing and in relation with IP issues, we have a patent application with a very good opinion from the European Patent Office. Next steps are large scale production and commercialization. Rapid market introduction of Osacil is currently by an ongoing agreement with a Spanish pharma. This innovation is only possible with a strong team. In our case, mainly composed by women, highly skilled and with track record, bringing innovation into the real world. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much, Arate. Thank you for bearing with us and being patient there as the gremlins. Delighted that we did get your slides back and you could finish your very interesting pitch. Mm -hmm. We do have a few questions that have come in from the jury on uh, on the chat. Uh, can you give us a, from the jury? Can you give us a bit more information on the business model, in particular partnerships with delivery companies, etc.? Yes, yes. This this device um, uh, for the lactose intolerance di diagnostic that um, we we need. Uh, there is a company, a Spanish company, that has a patent, and they have a diagnostic drug that only uh, taking a pill uh, in the morning, you have to wait five hours and then take a sample of urine. And our device can um, measure the an analyte in this urine to check if you are uh, lactose intolerant or no. So our business model is uh, um, goes with this uh, drug, okay? So this Spanish pharma is commercializing this drug, but uh, currently the method to analyze uh, uh, to analyze the, uh, this parameter is very very difficult. So they want a point of care device to go to the market. So we it's uh, like a partnership with with them. One other question. One other question. Have you considered the risks around moving physical examination, self-diagnosis, patients not being able to identify their own symptoms? Um, the self, this, this is not for self-diagnosis, okay? okay? This this is uh, yes, this is to and uh, this uh, device. The the end users are medical specialists, so so they will will do the uh, analytical. Uh, check no no um, the patent itself. Okay. Um, very good. I'm not seeing. Hang on. I'm just checking. I'm not seeing any other questions. So I think the jury. Mm, I'm just checking. Yeah, I know more questions from the jury. So they've obviously everything we've gotten everything they need from you. So once again, okay. uh, many thanks. Thank you. To you. Okay, uh, now I'm 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 wondering if uh, either SDS Optic or is is can you, hello Magdalena? Can you hear us? I We can Hello. see you typing, uh, Magdalena. Ah, Tace, you're back. That's good to have you back, Tace. So we will uh, change to the next presenter. Um, Magdalena, should we change to your slides? Can you get your audio to work? Otherwise, I see we have Pedro Costa ready to go. Um, if you want, Pedro, you can take over this um, the sharing. Ah, yes, I see. Pedro, we can we can see okay. you. Yeah, and, hear and you. I guess now you can hear me. Mm -hmm. So I will start uh, sharing my screen then. So we stopped sharing. Hopefully, it's now possible for you to start. Yeah, let me try again. 
And then I'd like to ask, while we are loading this, I'd like to ask SDS Optics and Daphne to try and connect uh, in the background and get ready to present after Pedro. Okay, so I'll be sharing my full screen. I think that's the only possible option at the moment. Let's see how this goes. So can you see my screen right now? <laughs> it's probably going to take a few seconds to load. OK. Let me know when you can see it. Okay, so can you see it now? It is appearing, yes, we, I can see it now. Your screen okay, is perfect. linked to so me. So I will start the PowerPoint. Can you see the, the full screen with the PowerPoint? Yes, I can. At least I can, Pedro. Happy to confirm that I can see your slides. Okay. So uh, then I will start. I hope everybody else is able to see it as well. I assume so. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so let's start. Uh, hello. My name is uh, Pedro Costa. I'm the CEO of uh, Biofabrix. And uh, at Biofabrix, we provide organs on chips at the click of a button. So as you may all know, the human body is extremely complex. And for this reason, it is also very difficult to understand how it really works all the time. Over the years, uh, uh, in vitro and animal testing has been commonly used to mimic the human body to a certain extent and predict how it would work in certain specific conditions. However, these uh, methods do have serious limitations. They are increasingly inaccurate, they are expensive, and they are also often ethically undesirable. So at Biofabics, we are creating an alternative to these methods. We are developing a digital database of micro devices, which can very closely imitate the morphology and physiology of human organs and tissues. And what is also really great about this database is that these devices can be easily selected, customized, and purchased at a click of a button. And then upon purchase, our company manufactures the devices and ships them back to the client in a very short time. And given this special ability to customize, our clients can easily range from the typical small cell culture lab in a university to a fully automated analytical facility for example, in a pharma company. It's that simple. Uh, but well, um, you may be wondering, well, how can we do all of this? Well, actually, my team and I have been doing this for the last few decades. We have developed in the past and during this project, several devices and published promising results in quite prestigious scientific journals. No, that's cool. We are also involved in several European research projects where we are developing new devices to mimic multiple organs and tissues for multiple applications. And in the meanwhile, together with a few prizes, we've been able to raise over 900,000 euros in funding. But while equally important is that we now have a very extensive network of top expert collaborators all over the world who will be testing validating and promoting our technology in their own specific fields. As for the market for this technology, it is also looking very, very promising. It is still at an early stage, but growing exponentially. 
And that's why we believe that this is exactly the right time to enter the market. We have recently released our online customization platform, and we soon intend to establish a fully automated manufacturing facility in Europe and later on in the North American region. Of course, all of this in parallel with continuous development of our platform, of our tools and technologies, and establishing continuously these key partnerships with the scientific community. And in the end, what does make us uh, so unique? Well, we have a very unique set of expertise and know-how, and this is very difficult to find in one single place and in one single institution. Uh, we are also located in Portugal, uh, right at the heart of University of Porto, where we can easily find the best human resources and multiple partners. We are Biofabrics uh, and we are excited to provide our technology to the world at the click of a button. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Do we have any questions from the jury? We have some questions. Owen, could you read them out? Is, uh, okay. Is, is this the one from Vanessa? Uh, yes, I have. Pedro, question for you. How can it be ensured that the data being recorded and sold is solely used for improving therapies versus actually being used against the customer, targeting them with marketing for higher priced pills? Uh, with higher priced, uh, sorry? Uh, Wait, I, 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 well. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. No. Okay. Sorry. Jury, then, okay. That, that, forget about that question. There, okay? <laughs> yeah, no problem. It, to the jury, and I'm asking this over WhatsApp. Can you tell us on the WhatsApp group, dear jury, what if any questions you have because i'm uh, the the interface okay so uh, actually owen they're they're in the public chat but we can't turn on our microphone because of some like echo weirdness we've turned off our audio so we can't hear you i'm just gonna quickly in one go read out the questions now the first one is actually how are you able to manufacture these customized devices in an efficient way and could you explain that process and then owen could you mm -hmm. scroll down in the public chat to ask the next one thank you very much yeah, so how can we uh, manufacture the customized devices in an efficient way? Well, that's the beauty of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. We use mainly 3D printing. So basically our vision uh, is to have the client pressing a button on his end and then setting up a whole uh, manufacturing process fully automated on our side and then the device comes out of a production line and then we ship it to the to the client uh, so that's how we make it very very efficient okay full automation basically very good pedro thank you Part apologies for the confusion with the question i mistakenly asked you but okay but this one is for you uh, could you please tell us a bit more about the, the product roadmap and how you expect mm -hmm. the product to evolve in the future pedro uh, yes. Um, so as for the platform, uh, we are always uh, developing it further and further more. And actually, it will always be like that because there will always be a need for a new device for some new application or new organ or tissue. Um, uh, but do, we do have uh, multiple, uh, first of all, multiple three actually customer segments, which have some different requirements, and I can tell you which ones they are. On one end, there are the you know typical uh, research labs in some university, right? On the ex other opposite end are the the you know typical big pharma, which need uh, a lot of uh, devices for, uh, let's say, drug screening, drug discovery, things like that. And then there's another third segment, a segment in the middle, which is also very interesting, uh, which are um, equipment manufacturers. Uh, and actually, at the moment, we are in talks with one of one such uh, manufacturer. 
So let's say that there is a manufacturer of, uh, let's say, uh, sample and fluid management uh, equipment. So for automation of uh, the management and, and all of this. Well, these manufacturers at the moment have a big problem. They uh, either, uh, well, because this uh, organ on chip uh, is, is here to stay and it will be the, will be the new reality in, in research, in biomedical cell-based, tissue-based research. Uh, and they have a big problem because they will need to adapt their equipment, their technology to these new uh, technologies, to these new devices. And well, we can actually solve that problem very easily because instead of them uh, modifying and upgrading their devices, their, their equipments, which usually are also extremely expensive. So their buyers will not be very happy with having to buy a new multi-million uh, equipment again. Uh, so what we provide is the, the other solution, much easier for everyone and much cheaper. So we basically provide the possibility of adapting these new devices, this new organ on chip technology to their equipment. So the manufacturer is happy, very happy because they don't need to worry much about it. Their equipment will always work with any kind of uh, device. And the, their clients will also be very happy because first of all, they won't have to buy a new equipment. And second of all, they can create all kinds of new uh, devices and they know it will fit exactly in those uh, equipments from the manufacturers. Thank you. And uh, yeah, that's great. But yeah. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I, I I would like now to uh, invite Daphne. Yes, we can see you, Daphne. You can hear us. It would sound like. Um, yes. Thais, can we load up the slides for Daphne, please? Yes. Uh, Michal is trying to share his screen again. Um, it should be with you shortly. We're just gonna. You can hear me, right? We can hear, we can you. hear you. Okay, Daphne, we can see you. We just we need to get the third part of this trinity ready, and that is your slides. And then we will be ready to go. Uh, I think patience is the name of the game today, and I'm, uh, I thank everybody for their patience. Pictures, audience, jury. Okay, yes. I think our screen is now sharing. We are going to go to... Um, There's, yeah. So, okay, definitely, I can also see you this time. So just raise your hand when you're ready for the next slide. Hello, uh, I'm Daphne, co-founder and CFO of Clean Stores and innovation manager of Plaggy Project. This is the Acropolis in August 2019, a clear image of over tourism. And today we have no tourism at all. The long-standing problem was that guided tours were too expensive to, for some people. And today, they even don't offer social distancing. And the tourism industry is racing to increase the revenues. Online travel agencies are looking for smart app sales, while, while tour guides are looking for alternative revenues. The online tourism activities market is worth 27 billion US dollars, and investors are looking for the next big thing in travel tech. The opportunity lies in personalized products built via a scalable way, like our self-guided product. Our platform offers a scalable way to produce high-quality self-guided tours by professionals. And those tours are high-converting upsells for OTAs to increase the revenues. We have two main tech tools, Clean News Create, our offering tool and booking management system, and Clean News Apps for Android and iOS and tour experience for the web that travelers use to take our audio, virtual, or skip the line products. This shows our growth within the last three years. In 2019, we've multiplied our revenues by 10, only by selling audio tour products to 50,000 travelers. In 2020, while tourism is falling, we activated our sustainability plan. <clears throat> which includes museums to use our platform to digitize their exhibitions and engage their audience while paying subscriptions. Online travel agencies and authors get commissions when travelers book a tour. Our growth strategy was always based on the B2B2C model. Our tours are then distributed through the biggest online travel agencies globally that have a great audience, thus lowering our user acquisition costs and our expansion costs. 
Till today, we've raised 500,000 euros from Unifund Venture Capital, which is part of Equifund, in November 2018 and December 2019, and have been granted 360k euros by two Horizon 2020 projects, one of them being Pluggy. We supersede our competitors in these ways because we have a great content and great network. Um, and we are a team of 13 people, complementary backgrounds and skills, striving to make culture sustainable. And that's why, uh, together with, uh, with a consortium of uh, nine other partners, we built Pluggy. And specifically, we built Pluggy Teams to democratize culture. Because with Clear News, we follow a strict tour structure, whereas with Pluggy, any heritage community or educator can create their own concept recipe and share tours with the world. And Pluggy supports our vision to generate universal cultural awareness and guide you in every part of the world utilizing pioneering technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Daphne. So we have a first question coming in from Vanessa. How do you assure the quality while still being able to skill um, so that you don't have to check every single input and how do you acquire the uploader of tours in all these areas? Uh, okay, so for the first scale, um, at first we have a very specific funnel for authors that want to create tours with us that they have to follow. They submit forms that are easy to understand if they have their credentials to create a tour. Also, especially for tours that are most interesting for us, uh, for attractions or for very uh, big uh, capitals, we basically choose the authors because we create ads that are targeted to specific professionals that are the either tourist guides or archaeologists and historians. And the second part is that our platform has incorporated our award-winning storytelling methodology, which is the most important part that helps us make the content scalable. Uh, because uh, the platform helps the author understand how much content, in what structure, they should build it because each point of interest is presented by five, uh, two to five short stories of 30 second story, uh, seconds each to last. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, another question is, how are you incentivizing participation? Uh, meaning by authors or by distributors? Uh, let's, let's tackle both. Okay, uh, so authors, especially right now, have interest in sharing their content and sharing their specialization in making great tours with the world because we don't have tourism. So we, they need to incorporate in a scalable way their content and sell it and make money because they get commission out of it. So this is a definite uh, high selling point. Also, we attract audience because we already have the distribution channels that support it, which means that authors know that if they upload with us a tour, we will surely have... Uh, have them sold, which is very important. So in terms of distribution, because we have learned exactly, because we started with museums, we know exactly how to create high selling products. We know what, is, what an audio tour should look like to be engaging. So um, they trust us to do great work and they and our products are highly reviewed on all distribution channels, Get Your Guide, Viator, TripAdvisor, Booking. Okay, thank you. Um, we're sadly running out of time. We have a couple more questions that came in. It would be great if you could answer them in the chat. Um, in the okay. meantime, um, we're going to switch over to Magdalena with SDS Optics. Can I, you hear me now? I can hear you and I can see you. Fantastic. Perfect. <laughs> Super. So just yeah, raise your hand when you're ready to move to the next slide. Um, over to you. OK. My name is Magdalena Staniszewska. Uh, I represent SDS Optic company based in Lublin in Poland, and I present uh, our breakthrough technology in probe for smart cancer diagnostics. What we do in the company is we merge photonics and molecular biology into point of care testing in order to address uh, today's diagnostic needs. So the problem that in probe can solve is the current diagnostic standard that is very much not ideal. It is based on the painful biopsy, it has high rate of false negative and false positive results and also high treatment costs. So what we believe in the future is we can use our in-probe technology 
as a revolution as fast and painless cancer diagnostics. We believe that the good diagnostics is a key in uh, effective treatment. So even by year 2030, we are uh, trying to decrease cancer death by 30%. Our product consists of the specially prepared bioprobe that is inserted into very thin needle and that needle is connected to the fiber optic that then sends the optical signal to the detecting device which calculates and presents the data in the numerical uh, value of the biomarker level. So there is no more need for biopsy, the procedure is quick and the results are objective. And what's even more exciting is that there is numerous bio possibilities of the biomarkers due to technology scaling up opportunities. At the end, the patient is getting right and quick diagnosis. So everything started in 2014 when the company was founded. We went through different phases of our technology development. Uh, today we are at the clinical device development and calibration stage. Soon we plan to move into clinical validation and after getting certifications, we plan to launch our first product on market that will be detecting HER2 in breast cancer tumors. But even more exciting is uh, moving into our uh, new uh, applications and we have uh, some on our radar. This, this consists of uh, other biomarkers, uh, cancer biomarkers, but also monitoring of drug delivery uh, not mentioning other intraocular diagnostics or infectious diseases. So the market in 2020 that we have estimated based on the tumor biomarker test uh, equals uh, over 15 billion euros. However, when you take into consideration other applications that we have in radar, it can sum up into uh, over 25 billion euros. We work uh, in the interdisciplinary team. Here's our core team members, um, consisting myself being a scientist. I lead uh, R&D department uh, with six women and four other scientists. But I also have a support from uh, the co-founder of the company, Marcin Staniszewski, uh, business uh, specialist, Mateusz Saga, and also medical expert, Przemysław Kopyto. So in the future, we plan to expand our core technology into other applications, and we are looking for the new, new capital. Uh, we also encourage other scientists which want to help in changing today's diagnostics to join our team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Do you have any questions from the jury? From, yes, I do have one question for you, Magdalena, from yes. Maruna on the jury. Could you please expand on the potential of the technology to scale to other cancer markers? Sure, so this is even not just on the radar, we are working on it. We selected some very important uh, cancer biomarkers, uh, which are also soluble, and this is the potential for uh, our technology. So the thing is that we only have to develop and prepare specially the bioprobe. So if it's dedicated to other biomarkers, it can be easily adopted. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing another, any other question at this moment from the jury. I'm just seeing if anything's going to come through on the chat. Okay. All right, uh, there may be one question. I see uh, one of the jury members is typing. Bear with me, this is, uh, sure. no, we have no more questions from the jury. They are satisfied with what you've been able to give in both your pitch mm -hmm. and the answer to the question. Magdalena, once more, thank you very much for your pitch. Thank um, you. And uh, if we now, uh, we'd like to go to our final pitch, which would be uh, uh, Joanna from the Nano Cargo Innovation in, in Poland. Uh, Joanna, we think you are uh, re registered as Mikola. Is If that is you, could you turn on your video, please, Joanna? N no, I'm not seeing. 
I'm just jo I'm looking through the list of presenters here to see if um, I can see Joanna listed uh, from. No, I'm not seeing her. Um, yes, excellent. I Joanne, I see your, your the, what you just posted in the chat that you can hear us, but you cannot join. That's um, unfortunate. Let's see what. Okay, if you cannot join, um, what I would make. Okay, what I'm actually going to propose is Joanna. We're going to see. It, it, for some reason, you cannot join the platform here. If if uh, what I would suggest is that we we uh, after this session here. We give you an opportunity to do so via do a pitch to the jury via Zoom, uh, because I, I know of the uh, excellent work you have been leading, and that you want to present. We have your slides, um, but if you, for some reason, technical reason, cannot join uh, with this platform, let's try with another platform immediately afterwards. Um, so, ladies, gentlemen, jury members, audience members, pictures, I want to say, extend a huge thanks, sincere thanks to you all for uh, your engagement here, your contribution, and most of all, for your patience. Thank you for uh, in, uh, hanging in there with us as we deal with the, uh, the, the gremlins that we have had during this session. But nonetheless, I am delighted with what we have seen presented here. I mean, these were, we had 11 pitches. We're going to do a 12 separately. These are 11 brilliant pitches about some quite sensational breakthroughs in science and technology that has been delivered with EU funding. I know the jury is going to have a tough time making a choice among all of the finalists in each category, and I look forward to having the deliberation session with them afterwards. But uh, congratulations to all of the pitches. Uh, big thanks to the jury, and also big thanks to Thais and Michal and the DealFlow team, who have been working so hard with these, uh, with these innovators in order for them to help them refine their pitch, uh, uh, shape their messages, and deliver uh, uh, and show the promise that they have that they can deliver with these brilliant innovations. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, let's bring this session to a close. Do come back at uh, 15.40, if I'm not mistaken, when the commissioner will be announcing the winners of the uh, Innovation Radar Prize. Once again, big thank you. Enjoy the rest of the EIC hubs, and I look forward to you joining for the award ceremony later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.